Welcome everybody to our first week of Advent and our first week of decorations. Nadine, thank you, I don't know if she's here or not, for leading us into getting all the decorating done yesterday. Ron Millard, thank you for getting up on the ladder, very nice. And Chris Lackey, thank you for taking the vacuum home, cleaning the whole thing, and buying new bags for it. Thank you so much to give us this beautiful decorations and a clean uh, uh, sanctuary. Birthdays this week are Tori Wise, Betty Parrish, and Caitlin Bennett's. Does, and does anybody know how Betty Parrish is doing? Anybody have an update? Okay. Okay. Um, also on the prayer list, we do have an update on Jack Cave's son. And they decided, if, if you don't know what's going on, his son had, uh, what are they called in his blood lungs? Clots. Blood clots in his lungs. So they decided, instead of doing the surgery that they were planning to do, which was a very uh, intricate surgery, that they're just going to let, try to let those dissolve. So we're hoping that that's what's going to happen. Welcome to Elaine and Steve. Nice to see you today. Today is the day we need to have our availability sheets turned in. And you might notice that where you normally turn them in are some uh, Christmas cards, but don't let that throw you. Just go ahead and put them in there so that Pam and Karen can take those and, uh, and get us all set up on our availability sheets. For 
Oh, we have a th we got a Robin got a thank you that I'd like to share. Hopefully, since I've had all these papers in my hand, here they are. Okay, this is our thank you from Robin for Robin. Robin, I had so much fun going through all the yarn yesterday. There is such a good variety of variegated and solid colors and so many full skeins. I took it to the Roland Park Community Center this morning and the staff there couldn't get over your generos generosity what all I was bringing in. I will not be able to be at knitting tomorrow, which they do at Roland Park, but have let the others know they will be in for a treat. Please let the members of your church know how much their generosity with the yarn and their time given to the Central Avenue Center of Hope is appreciated. And the lady who signed that is Nan Geely. And if you don't know the history on that, we have been holding skeins of yarn that everyone has donated for well over a year, you think? Susan? Okay. About a year. About a year. <laughs> and uh, several times I said, I don't think they're coming back. And the lady came back, got the yarn. They were down to having only white to work with. And it's a knitting group over at Roland Park Community Center. Then they're the ones that sent all of the hats that we had last week that we, that we donated to Center of Hope. So if you have any extra yarn, uh, these ladies do appreciate that. We also got a lovely thank you letter from the Riney family. And I have, and it's on the bulletin board. And I also heard that Clint's mom is doing, is doing better. Anything else for prayer list that anybody has that I missed? Any updates? Okay, for Vespers on 1219, the time is six o'clock and uh, Jane and Sharon Wood, are, Jane Landrum and Sharon Wood are putting together our service for that evening. So six o'clock on December 19th. Are there any other announcements that I have missed? Anybody got anything? Okay. So a couple weeks ago, I went and uh, went to the temple and I, I walked the labyrinth. They had a special come walk the labyrinth uh, thing. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it. What they did there, and if you don't know, a labyrinth is, is like a, almost like a maze. It's a round thing, usually round, and you walk through, and then you have to walk back through. And what they taught us when I went to, to walk it at the temple is that when you walk in, you release anything that you brought in, kind of like when we come into the sanctuary, we release. Then when you're in the center, you uh, stay in the center and you talk and you ask what God is inviting you to receive and allow God's light to pour over you and flow through you. And that's called the receiving part of the labyrinth. And it's kind of like coming in here. And so now we have time right now to, to be in the light and to share our time with, with the Holy Spirit. And then as we end, as you, we ended the labyrinth and started walking back out, it's the journey out or returning. And you ask, what are you going to take with you? And how are you called to let your light shine into the, in the world? Very similar to coming to church. We release whatever we were thinking about. We come into church and we share the light and then we go back out into the world. <clears throat> Our call to worship today is the call to worship that is the uh, scripture that's on our, our uh, window, which is section 161. Lift up your eyes and fix them on the place beyond the horizon to which you are sent. Journey and trust assured that the great and marvelous work is for this time and for all time Claim your unique and sacred place within the circle of those who call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Be faithful to the spirit of the restoration, mindful that it is a spirit of adventure, openness, and searching. Walk proudly and with a quickened step. Be a joyful people. Laugh and play and sing, embodying the hope and freedom of the gospel.
Our gracious and loving Father, we are in the middle of uh, seasons of Thanksgiving and Christmas, and which draws our thoughts to you and to our fellow people. Uh, this is the was the 400th anniversary of Thanksgiving from the very first one, which wasn't called Thanksgiving, of course. But we all are very thankful of the things that we are, that we have and that we're capable of doing. We're thankful for our fellow, fellow uh, friends here and thankful for you and, and Jesus in his holy purpose. Uh, we wish that you would be with us this, e this morning uh, with your loving and kind spirit that will draw us all together and that will be inspired by the message and all of the uh, participation that we do. And I thank you for so many things. In Jesus' name, amen. The lightings of these candles reminds us of the promise that a light would come to the world. Each candle brings us closer to the time when we recall his birth as well as his second coming. Remembering Jesus' parable in Matthew 25, 1 to 13, which is a parable of the ten virgins, we also seek to be wise and have our lamps ready for the bridegroom who is coming again. As Jesus said, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. As we worship our Lord Jesus and recall his first coming, look forward to his second coming, let us also be attentive to the present coming. As Max Licato has written, the one who came still comes, the one who spoke still speaks. May the Lord use this season to draw you and your family closer to him, that you may know his presence and hear his voice in a fresh way. Today we light the first candle of the Advent candles. This is the candle of hope. With Christians around the world, we use this light to help us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. May we receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. And in the New Testament scripture from Romans 15, verse 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Lord, as we look to the birth of Jesus, we think of the light from the burning of the candle and are reminded of the light that your only begotten Son brings to us in this earthly life. We pray that the light of your love for us will help us to become lights in the lives of those around us. And as we relate to the people of old and their hope for salvation, we ask that we are able to prepare our hearts for the joy and gladness of your coming. For Jesus is our hope. Amen.
Will you join me in prayer, please? Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, today we lift our prayers in the pursuit of peace. May your light and compassion be spread to others through us, your humble disciples. Guide us to be loving to all your creation. Open our hearts so that we may help those who are our victims of injustice. Let those who are hurt feel your presence and know that they are loved. May your peace and love flow through us in this time. We ask this in your most holy name. Amen. Dorothy's probably one of my oldest, Dorothy and Russell, probably some of my oldest friends, and she, she never ceases to amaze me, the things that she can do. Our scripture lesson for today comes out of the book of Jeremiah, and which upset me to begin with because, you know, we need the New Testament for Christmas, right? But when I stop and think about uh, where we are today in terms of fiscal and political and social reality, uh, maybe Jeremiah is a little more closely related. But anyway, it comes from the 33rd chapter, the 14th to the 16th verse, where God makes, jo makes Jeremiah and the Israelites this promise. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise that I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And in those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. During the next four weeks, we're going to reflect upon the four themes of each of the Advent candles that we have lit, we've, we've lit hope today. There'll be hope, love, joy, and peace. And so this Sunday, we've begun with the first candle, the candle of hope. As we meditate on the word of God recorded by the prophet Jeremiah, what makes you hopeful? A lot of students are hopeful this time of year. I can just barely remember back that far. Because we can see the light at the end of the tunnel of finals. Some even have graduation to look forward to. And they're hopeful about the future. You can often see it in their eyes. Often, though, when we begin to look ahead, particularly in this century, in this year, we become anxious and we become uneasy. What makes you less hopeful or even hopeless? There's a lot of anxiety out there about the fiscal cliff. There's a lot of talk about the difficulty of college graduates and even other people that have been laid off finding work. There's a lot of political dissent and social dissent going on. And each of us, no doubt, gets stirred up and gets anxious by the different developments in our lives. Sudden changes in health can cause us to become less hopeful. Stresses about the finances and the children the overall well-being of our families are constantly in the minds of some of us. And when we think of those things and others like them, hopelessness dims our sense of security, wavers. Whatever your troubles, Jeremiah would understand your condition. He often struggled with the seemingly hopeless conditions of the time in which he lived. First of all, Jeremiah was called to be a prophet in a time when God's people refused to listen to sermons. They resented God's word and they resented his messengers. And at least twice there were attempts to kill Jeremiah. He was also arrested and he was held prisoner in the soggy bottom of a well. Jeremiah shared his feelings of frustration and hopelessness as he prayed to God. He says, oh Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. You're stronger than I and yet you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everybody mocks me for wherever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction for the word of the Lord has become for me a, repro a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more his name, there is in my heart as if it were a fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in. That's a little earlier in the, ch in the 20th chapter. At the very center of Jeremiah's life, his calling and work given to him by God, there was tension, there was rejection, and there was frustration. Jeremiah often struggled with losing hope because he saw that there was no fruit for his labor, only pain and trouble. And if his inner struggle wasn't enough, the outside world was even worse. The people were going on like nothing was wrong. But Jeremiah knew that the situation was hopeless. God's people had been divided for some time now between Israel in the north 
and Judah in the south. Israel had already fallen to the Assyrians, and now Judah was backed into a cliff of its own. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was about to conquer Jerusalem and enslave its population. The temple, the glory of Jerusalem, would be destroyed. Jeremiah was called to tell the people that this would happen. He had an even more difficult job than that, though. He was called to tell the people that this was happening because they brought it upon themselves. They'd rejected the God who loved them so much, filled with false hope that everything was going to be all right, they would soon be completely hopeless. What a terrible situation. How anxious we might be and hopeless we might feel. These forces do not suppress or surpass the internal and external challenges that face Jeremiah. Into this hopeless situation, God gives a remarkable word for Jeremiah to preach to the people. Not only would it later give them comfort, but it comforted him during this hopeless time. In those days, he said, I would raise up a righteous branch to spring up from David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. If his inner struggle wasn't enough, the outside world was even worse. The people were going on like nothing was wrong. Like but Jeremiah knew that this was hopeless. For some reason here, I got my notes all mixed up. Amidst the chaos and the uncertainty, God gives this healing and refreshing promise to Jeremiah and all of the people to hear. It's more than just a word though. This word will change reality. It brings hope to a hopeless situation. Jerusalem would experience terrible bloodshed and anguish and enslavement for their sins. And yet God says, that's not the final word. Once again, she will dwell in security and enjoy prosperity. There will be a time when the people will be hopeful again. When the people were finally captive in Babylon, they would hope in this promise of the prophets that God would restore his people forever. And as Isaiah had promised, though their sins were like scarlet, they would become what is snow, perfectly forgiven and perfectly restored. This great reversal would happen when a lowly rabbi entered in like a conquering king on a donkey. Jesus fulfills Jeremiah's word perfectly. He is the seed of David, the righteous branch that sprouted up. The people received Jesus as a king at first, they thought he'd come to do what a victorious king would do. He'll make sacrifices at the temple in thanksgiving to God, and then he'll take up David's throne. Little did they know that he had come to make sacrifice, but the sacrifice would be his own body. The same Jerusalem who had rejected God in the time of Jeremiah rejected him again. He was enthroned on a cross and he was crowned with thorns. People thought that this Jesus was the hope of Israel, but now he was gone. His disciples fell into hopelessness and they locked themselves up in rooms lest they meet an end like his. And then, the promised king came to them 
when they were at their lowest. He entered through these doors that they had shut themselves up in their own hopelessness and misery, and he said, peace be with you. Hope, profound and permanent hope was theirs because Christ was risen from the dead. That is yours in Jesus too. Jeremiah said that the kingdom of God would be known as the Lord is our righteousness. That righteousness is ours when God placed his name upon us as we joined him in his death and his resurrection in our baptisms. His death has done away with Israel's sin, of Judah's sin, and your sin. His resurrection has given you life that is in God so you know that no matter what troubles you or causes you to lose hope, it will never mean God will lose you. At the time of Jeremiah, the people were not very attractive, nor were they very lovable at all. And yet in this word, God shows us that he does not love us because we're so lovable, but rather we're loved before we're made lovable. We're forgiven our sins and made white as snow by God's grace. Now apply that to your hopeless situations. The counsel of others is too often that if you think positively, positive things will happen. And that might be true at times, but it also puts the onus on us as if hope is something we have to find within. But think of Jeremiah in the very pits of hopelessness. Just as in Christ, God the Father loves us before we were ever lovable, so also he gives us hope before we were ever hopeful. Christian hope is not dependent upon how you're feeling at a given moment or what is happening within or outside of you. Christian hope is summed up in the name Jeremiah promises us. The Lord is our righteousness. And if we take a moment to reflect upon those things that try to make us feel safe and secure and hopeful, we see that they can't deliver true hope. The stock market, fiscal plans, insurance, physical prowess, beauty, popularity, all of those places that promise lasting hope just can't deliver. The wealthiest person can lose it all and he will still die. The most solid fiscal plan is still dependent on the ups and downs of human and natural history. And how silly to regard any of those things as the end of our hope, to treat them as gods. But to say this, and trust this, the Lord is our righteousness. That gives true hope. Many people heard Jeremiah's message and they rejected it because they just couldn't see beyond the present. The present promises of either health or wealth or gloom and doom. Wherever you place your hope will determine your actions in the present. So they went chasing after those things, and when they failed, they fell into that hopelessness. And yet some heard Jeremiah, and they saw the glory and the awesome wonder of God. They trusted that one day that he would restore all things just as he promised, that all the things they hoped for and couldn't find in the world, peace and security, health and life, can only be found in the God who raised from the dead a branch of David. Wherever you place your hope 
will determine your actions in the present. So as they hoped for the future, they confessed their sins and they received the love of God. They lived in the midst of their troubles, trusting that God would deliver them out of them all. They sought not to live as they did in the past, worshiping and hoping in false things and sinning against their God. They sought God and they looked forward to the arrival of the righteous King. And we should take that example to heart. We live in the presence of our future hope. The presence of Christ with us in the present form our future and determine how we conduct ourselves in the present. Let's never grow apathetic to the glorious gospel in the future that we have in Christ. This future has led the church throughout time to live in the light of the future, doing works of mercy and love towards those around them. And so we rejoice with Jeremiah, living in the presence with their eyes on the hope and the future of Christ's return. We do so filled with hope, knowing that we will be delivered from any sin or trouble that besets us now. So as we look upon the turmoil of the world, we're tempted to either turn our televisions off or throw something through the screen. We worry about what's going to happen to our security, the retirements, the finances that we've planned on and wonder where they're going. But even more importantly, as we see the animosity and the violence that we continue to heap upon one another, let us remember that Jeremiah was faced with that same thing with the people that were filled with the same insecurities, the difficulties and the differences and the strife. And yet when he stopped and he responded to the creator God that loved him enough, that he made them lovable, that he cared for them enough, that he made them worthwhile, that he expected enough from them that he said, look, if you stop and if you think and if you reconsider, I give you hope. And that's what we celebrate today. As we begin this season of Advent and we grow through the four Sundays of Advent, let's start with hope. Let's fall back upon the God that made us that created love that we might understand and that we might live, that we might unite our hearts and our minds and our lives with one another. And as we do that, as we come together, we'll find that we rise above dissension. We rise above political turmoil and all political turmoil is not bad. It becomes bad when it becomes animosity and it becomes very personal to us rather than the purpose for which it's intended. As we worry about perhaps the future of our finances, let us fall back upon the fact that this seemingly simple person riding on a donkey entered the, his contemporary world and he said, hey, there's something better. There's something more simple. There's something that brings you peace, that brings you love, that brings you serenity. And if you embrace and stay true to those things, we'll transcend the problems that we think bring themselves down upon our world. And in that realization, we might come to find that which Jeremiah was given to call. 
Christ's righteousness. So I invite you to share in this day of hope. I invite you to share in this season that we might find ways to renew and refresh and strengthen our relationships, not only with one another, but with the loving Creator God that created us with purpose, for a purpose, that indeed we might bring light into each other's lives and love into each other's hearts and hope into each other's beings. Amen. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Loving Heavenly Father, as we share our offerings, we are tangibly expressing our gratitude for all the blessings and gifts we have received from you. Be with us and guide us in allocating these offerings to best achieve the goal of fulfilling Christ's mission. May we use our resources in ways that build healthy, happy relationships with you, with others, and with the earth. May we remember the teachings of Jesus that challenge us to make lifestyle choices that are counter to our culture of accumulation and excess. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
What I forgot to say at first is that you may notice I am not Dorothy May, and Dorothy has done our music for us all day today. Thank you, Dorothy, because Margaret is not feeling, Margaret Athey's not feeling well, so Charles wasn't here today. Creator God, our souls cry out with a joyful shout. Hallelujah. Thank you for surrounding us with your love, with your joy, with your peace, and with your hope as we go forward in joy. And as we share your light with the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.